When kids are forced to miss school by something like COVID-19, of course we worry about the long-term effect on their education. But as Will Cook of Manchester Metropolitan University explains, it's not that long since a previous health crisis kept kids away from school for several months. So what happened next? Hello, Will. Welcome. Hi, Tim. Now, Will, we suspect that kids who've been forced to miss school because of COVID-19, their education will have suffered. But how much do we really know at the moment about the effects of this outbreak? Well, I think we know on the one hand quite a lot, but on the other hand, very little. And just to explain that sort of contradictory answer, um, there's a lot of data collection going on about the effects on what are called learning inputs. So how much work uh, children are doing at home, how much they're going to school. So we know that has dropped significantly um, since since uh, since March. We also have evidence coming through that uh, children are performing a lot less well in assessments as well that are being done as they come back to school. And, and there's quite large um, effects being estimated. Um, we're also seeing that there's an inequality effect as well. So children typically from poorer households um, seem to be suffering the largest learning losses. But on the other hand, you know, these are very short term impacts. So we don't quite know yet how that's going to play out in the long term. Um, and it could be actually that, that pupils catch up both, you know, because that's what pupils tend to do throughout schooling, but also because of the policies that are going to be implemented to help pupils catch up. On the negative side of things, however, we haven't just got disruption of schooling and lost schooling time. We're also also facing an economic crisis, too. And we know that tends to affect learning as well. So that's another area where we can't be really too sure how the pandemic is going to affect uh, people's learning in the longer term. And when it comes to learning, we do have some evidence, don't we, from around the world from previous events that there might be a persistent effect of missing school. Yes, we do. Um, so I think that there are there are numerous studies that have looked at the effect of being absent from school, but those tend to kind of like focus on very short term absences. Um, they tend to find that there's a negative effect from missing school. Um, but I think possibly the most relevant study um, in terms of considering the, the COVID crisis is a study that looked at the effect of teacher strikes in, in Argentina over the 1980s. Um, and in that study, pupils missed around 7% of their primary school time, so quite a large chunk of schooling missed. And the estimated result of that was that uh, pupils uh, had lower educational attainment at the end of their compulsory schooling but also that they had lower wages into adulthood. Um, so it reduced their, their human capital, their productivity. And also another key finding of that study is that these effects were concentrated on poorer households, so increased inequality as well. And I think when thinking about the COVID crisis, that sort of study provides that sort of guide as to what the effects might be over the longer term, but also who's going to be affected the most by disruption to schooling. In your paper here, you use the impact of a previous epidemic on the schooling of British children. And I have to admit that even though it was fairly recent, it was one that I'd completely forgotten about. So for people like me, could you explain what happened in the UK in 2001? So um, back in 2001, um, around the same sort of time as the, the, the COVID crisis started, sort of February, March sort of time, um, we had the first cases of foot and mouth disease um, found in England. Um, now, foot and mouth disease is actually a virus that, that, that affects cattle. It doesn't really affect humans that much, but it is quite a serious um, virus because it affects um, feeding and walking and can actually kill um, baby calves as well. So it's it had the potential to really destroy a lot of the um, livestock industry. Um, the the kind of reaction to that was almost the same as with uh, the COVID crisis was was a was a, a scientific analysis of how the virus was going to spread and to put in measures to try and stop that spread. So what we had was a sort of lockdown. I mean, nothing like what we've experienced uh, over the last year. Um, but what we had was affected farms were closed down um, in rural areas. We had rights of way restricted. 
Um, some businesses, some public institutions have closed down, including schools as well. Um, and then in addition to that, we had the mass culling of animals. And you probably remember from the time the pictures in, in the media of, of huge piles of, of uh, cow carcasses being burnt um, on, on farms around the country. And I think that, that the foot and mouth disease crisis, because it was so concentrated in particularly remote rural areas of England, um, actually has largely been forgotten about. But for those areas, we not only had um, quasi shutdowns, we also had the psychological distress of, of seeing, you know, lots of dead animals being burnt. And we also had lingering economic effects as well on tourism industries and the agricultural industries as well. So that there are parallels with the current crisis um, that we're currently experiencing. And how could we use this to provide some kind of natural experiment on the impact of the crisis? When you look at the, um, the foot and mouth disease um, outbreak, it was really concentrated in particular areas. And so what we can do is we can go back and look to see whether areas that are affected by foot and mouth um, had different outcomes compared to areas that were not affected by foot and mouth. And in this study um, that, that I've published in COVID Economics, I'm looking at, at school outcomes. So we can look at schools and their performance in affected areas versus those that weren't affected. And crucially, we've got data in terms of their school performance prior to the outbreak. And we can quite clearly see that areas that are affected versus those that were not affected didn't have exactly the same performance before the, the crisis, but they had a similar trend. OK, so we can track the, the trend prior to the outbreak and then see after the outbreak, did the, the trends in the affected versus the non-affected area change in some way? Uh, what sort of age of kids are we talking about here and what kind of performance do you measure? Right. So in the study, we're looking at primary school children and it's particularly the tests that they take at age 11. So in English primary schools, we take uh, standardised tests in English and maths, back then in science as well, um, at the end of primary schooling. So at the age age of 11. Um, and these tests, although they were marked you know, out of 100, they also were looking at whether pupils reached a particular level. A lot of emphasis then uh, in education policy was whether pupils were reaching the expected level at the end of primary school, particularly in literacy and numeracy. And how do you then measure the impact that that has made on their educational attainment for the kids who had to stay out of school and compare that with the other kids? In this study, it was specifically looking at schools. We're using school level data rather than pupil level data. So what we could really do is look at um, whether particular schools that are affected by foot and mouth had different uh, performance at the end of primary school compared to those that that, that uh, were not affected. And what, what I did was looked at the trends beforehand, estimated the, the difference between affected and non-affected areas, and then looked at the, the trends after uh, the outbreak and looked at the difference between affected and non-affected areas. And what I think is particularly important about this study is that this wasn't just looking at the year after the outbreak happened. We also also look at years, you know, two and three years later. I think it actually goes up to four or five years later. And what that's, that's showing is, is the test scores of each cohort as it passes through that age 11 test point, if you see. So, for instance, a, a pupil who's age 11 taking their test in 2006 would have been age do my maths here, uh, would have been age six at the time of the, the foot and mouth outbreak. So what I'm sort of testing for there is if, if you experience that uh, disruption when you're age six, does that still show up you know, when you're age 11, essentially? OK, then, Will, tell us how big an impact, which subjects? Right. So what I found was that in the very year of the crisis, so it's 2001, um, schools have been disrupted for about two months, yeah, from March to about May. Um, there's no effect really on those pupils. So the pupils taking the test in the middle of the crisis, there's not really uh, much of an effect estimated. However, the year afterwards, we do see an effect and the largest effect is in maths. So in maths, there's a drop in the percentage of pupils reaching the expected level of five percentage points. So 5% less pupils um, 
reached the expected level in maths in uh, 2002, the year after the outbreak. So that was pupils who had, had their schooling disrupted from the March to the, the autumn of the year before they took the test. Um, and then going forward in time, what we see is that effect, negative effect getting smaller. OK, so over the next three or four years, that effect goes down to two, one percent, two percent, those that sort of level. And, and the estimates become not statistically significant. OK, I would say, however, the effects are still there. They are there are still a neg there is still a negative effect estimated. It just becomes less precisely estimated. Um, and one of the caveats to this study, we are using school level data with quite a relatively small sample size. So you would expect that, that, that our confidence in those estimates isn't in particularly large because the, because the, the, the range of, of effects that we estimate are quite, are quite wide. But assuming, Will, that your estimates are on the mark, it still doesn't sound like we should be running around with our hair on fire, panicking at the moment about the short-term effects because it seems that they're made up over time? Well, I'd say, firstly, the, the, um, the COVID, COVID crisis is a lot more severe than it was for the foot and mouth outbreak. We didn't have you know, months of closed schools. It was more a case of a few days, maybe a couple of weeks of closure. And then the bigger effect was that certain pupils didn't come into school for, for, for a long period of time, particularly if they lived on farms. Um, so it wasn't as widespread as, as the COVID crisis. Um, but I would agree that perhaps we may overestimate the effect of that disruption to schooling if we're just looking at the, the, the assessments that we're doing now. Because over time, we would expect that pupils would uh, catch up. I think as economists, perhaps we don't have the best models for explaining learning over time. We tend to think of it as kind of a, a linear straight line. Each year you gain a chunk of learning uh, when you're in school. But actually, if you look into the education literature, we know actually it's quite non-linear. You have years when pupils learn nothing and then they learn loads in one particular year. We even have evidence that in early secondary, there might be a regression with some pupils that they actually perform worse in, in uh, numeracy and literacy compared to when they're age 11. So given that, it's very difficult to say how people are going to be affected by the COVID crisis. But I think we can be quite confident that those taking exams next year will need the most um, help uh, with, with their assessments uh, compared to those who are going to be taking exams in, in, in a few years' time. Well, let's hope that they get it and we will find out over the next few years about the effect of COVID-19, won't we, Will? Yeah. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. The paper's called School Disruption and Pupil Academic Outcomes, Evidence from the 2001 Foot and Mouth Disease Epidemic in England. The author's Will Cook, and you'll find it in COVID Economics 40. Thanks for watching. You'll find lots more new research on the impact of COVID-19 in COVID Economics. And of course, that's free and open access at cepr.org.